Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, the Small Employers Webinar Series 2. My name is Jarliff McKenzie. I'm the Occupational Health and Safety Manager for the Manufacturing Safety Alliance of BC. Before we start here, I'll give you a quick little intro of who I am. Uh, I have a uh, 25 years experience in construction. Um, I held a air conditioning refrigeration mechanics license and a class B gas fitters license. I also hold uh, municipality certification for a firefighter and um, I came out west. I uh, worked in the trades, ended up getting hurt. I was off work for four years with a uh, lower back injury. During that time, I did the whole vocational rehab through WorkSafe and ended up getting a diploma in occupational health and safety with uh, BCIT. And that has led me to the Manufacturing of Safety Alliance, and I've been now doing this for, this is my fourth year. So with the webinar series, we're going to look at different elements that um, it is set up for the small employer and we're going to look at the different elements. Today we're going to look at element A, which is management, leadership, and commitment. So today's course objectives. By the end of this lesson, the goal is to be more familiar with the legal framework for management, leadership, and commitment, to have a better understanding of the responsibilities as an employer and what they are, as well as supervisors and workers, we need to have, ideally, a better understanding of the process of managing an OHNS program and the necessities of leadership and commitment, and to be able to identify and understand the relevance of processes to the OC audit requirements. We're going to split the topics up into two lessons. The first lesson is going to be duties, and the second lesson is going to be OSSE requirements which is the equivalent to the core certification in manufacturing. It is called the Occupational Safety Standard of Excellence. Lesson one, duties. We're going to have an introduction overall. We're going to discuss I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, I will attempt to get the sound corrected as soon as possible. Our presenter's computer has died. So. Yeah, this testing sound. Yeah, you're good. Okay. 
Um, can someone please type in uh, when the last time they heard me speak and I can go back to those slides? So I'm waiting for a response um, to which the last, sorry, technical concerns. So let me start from the beginning again, gentlemen. Just go back two slides. Okay, I'm just going to go back two slides here, and then we'll go over that. So, again, to review, lesson one's duties, we're going to look at an introduction to duties of the employer, duties of the supervisor, duties of the worker, um, duties of management, and if you have the opportunity, the duties of an oh &S advisor. Why is management and leadership a commitment? Why is management, leadership, and commitment an important part of an OHS program? It is a necessary part of any successful business undertaking. Safety is just like any other business system, like production, quality, inventory, accounting, or payroll. Therefore, managing safety like a business system that needs to be designed, developed, implemented, and evaluated to provide effectiveness and value. We're also going to look at the legal requirements. We're going to look at management from the leadership, from the top down, and required to talk the talk, walk the walk. There is nothing that will hurt developing an oh &S management system more than senior management not leading by example. And by this, I mean if they're out onto the floor or they're bringing potential clients out onto the floor, senior management must and should be in the same PPE, the personal protective equipment that is required on the floor. For instance, if the floor, you need to wear a hard hat, visi vest, steel toe boots, senior management needs to wear that as well. If they don't do that, workers will interpret that and see that as one, management doesn't care about the rules or they're not setting the examples. This also can potentially lead to a HR claim where they can say it's a bit of discriminatory where this person X was allowed to not wear them and now I'm getting written up. So um, basically lead by example and um, have commitment from the top down. Duties of the employer. There are two rules and regulations that we need to look at before I discuss this slide. One is the Workers' Compensation Act and the other one is WorkSafe BC's uh, Occupational Health and Safety Regulations. There's a bit of a difference between the two of them here. The Workers' Compensation Act is basically built on four parts, 41 divisions, and within those divisions, the main parts are compensation to workers and dependents, liabilities of employers and industries, not within the scope of Part A, occupational health and safety, and appeals, Whereas the regulations has 34 parts that deals with workplace health and safety, such as the rights and responsibilities, general conditions, and then it gets specific into such things as fall protection, tools, machines, equipment, cranes, hoists, mobile equipment, etc. So right now we're going to talk about the Workers' Compensation Act, and it requires that every employer must ensure safety of all workers working for that employer. It ensures that safety of any other workers present at the workplace at which the employer's work is being done and carried out. This means that if there's a contractor, a guest, a visitor, that falls under the responsibility of the employer. So if we have people coming as potential clients, contractors, um, they fall under whatever um, occupational health and safety policies procedures that you have and overall they are the responsibility of the employer. Um, the duties of the employers also include um, the need to comply with occupational health and safety regulations and any applicable orders from WorkSafe. Uh, not with limiting subsection 1, an employer must remedy any workplace condition that are hazardous to the health and or safety of the employer's workers. So what it's basically saying here is 
you know, you got to do what any other reasonable company will do when looking at health and safety. That's the easiest way to sum that, that section up. The employer must also ensure that workers are made aware of all or known reasonably or foreseeably health and safety hazards to which they are likely exposed um, by their work. They need to comply with this part of the regulations and any other applicable orders as mentioned now and they may need to be aware of their rights and duties under this part. The employers also need to establish a health and safety policies and programs in accordance to the regulations. One of the best examples here of how to set up your health and safety manual is by the elements that we are going to present today. If you'd like to take it to the next level, you can look at um, what the audit asks, but it's very similar to what we're, we set it up here today. Um, some companies in the past have set it up by the parts, the different sections in the workers' compensation uh, regulations, sorry, the uh, uh, WorkSafe BC regulations, but that's, that's not the way to do it. Uh, the best way to do it is to set it up with the uh, elements that were uh, the breakdown of elements that we're providing through this webinar. Uh, the employer also needs to provide and maintain a good condition of protective equipment, devices, clothing, uh, as regulated or required by the regulation, and also needs to ensure that these are used by the workers. So sometimes, and we're going to talk about this in the next section when we talk about supervisors. The employer needs to supply the personal protective equipment. It basically falls on the shoulders of the supervisor lead hands or whatever that role may be and we're going to talk about that and other employees to make sure that everybody's wearing the appropriate PPE or personal protective equipment. The employer must also provide to the workers information as we just discussed, the best ones to do this is uh, what the potential hazards of what they are doing, and that could be uh, biological, chemical, physical, psychological. We also need to look at how they can protect themselves. We also need to look at what engineering controls are in place, what administrative controls could be in place, um, and then down to PPE, which is the last one, the protective, uh, personal protective equipment. We need to look at infrastructure, and this is a key one here, training and supervision necessary to ensure the health and safety of those workers in carrying out their duties. So what we highly recommend at the Manufacturing Safety Alliance at BC is competency tests. We need to have documentation to prove that the employer, supervisor, or whoever um, delivered, whether it's a crew talk, whether it's a standard operating procedure, uh, not only reviewed that, but also answered some questions to understand, to show competency that they understood what was said. There's nothing worse than having a crew talk where everybody nods their head, we sign an attendance sheet, and there's no questions asked or no follow-up. Um, what that means is they stood there, sat for the meeting, they could have been having their own conversation, but nothing was um, retained or 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 understood. Um, this may seem a bit much at first, but in the incident where something happens and you have an incident where an injured worker is hurt, um, work safe, this is one of the things that they're going to ask for right away is uh, documentation and especially the training. We'll get into that in uh, other elements, but uh, I'll leave it at that. Documentation is extremely important. In real estate, there's three famous words. It's location, location, location. One thing that I'd like you to take away from this webinar today is if you just remember this, is in health and safety, it's documentation, documentation, documentation. If it's not documented, it never happened. So moving on, other duties of the employer need to ensure the health and safety of other workers at the workplace. And this is covered a bit in safety culture um, that we will uh, touch on later. And we need to make a copy of the acts and regulations readily available 
to review or for review from the employer's workers. So on this one, I highly recommend that you do not print this out. This is, if you were to print it out and I've seen it done, it doesn't even fit in the six inch binder. Not to mention the regulations are often amended monthly. Um, it, it's just a big headache. The best way to supply or have access to this is electronically, whether that's a, um, a link to the workers comp, uh, WorkSafe BC, um, that's the best way to do it because one, you're saving the paper copy, two, you don't have to worry about amending it all the time. And um, as an employer, you provided them access to it. Whether they ever go and look at it, that's up to them. But as an employer, you have um, uh, given them the ability and access that they can um, look up the either the Workers' Compensation Act or uh, the regulations. Uh, another duty of the employer is to consult and cooperate with joint health and safety committees um, or and or worker health and safety representatives for the employer. Now the difference between the joint health and safety committee and the safety representative for the employer is basically the number of the employees you have at your facility. If you are 19 or less, all you need is a single safety representative. If you're 20 or more, you need a committee. Uh, that is one of the other elements that we'll be talking about, but uh, just to differentiate the two, if you're 19 or less, you need a health and safety representative. If you're uh, 20 or more, you need a joint health and safety committee. Uh, the last point there, cooperation with the board. Whenever we mention the board, the board is WorkSafeBC and it's officers that uh, carry out the duty under the part of the regulations. So that just means um, we have to cooperate with WorkSafe. And I can tell you from past experience with uh, dealing with companies, um, we need to be nice to WorkSafe. They have a role, whether they're writing up orders or not, we need to be nice to them. Um, it usually doesn't fare well if we have a negative experience with them. Um, they'll come back and it won't be in your favor. And I'll just leave that at that. So now we're getting into the duties of the supervisor. So before I start with this, I want to give a definition of a supervisor. And a supervisor is a person who instructs, directs, and controls workers in the performance of their duties. A supervisor, and this is key here, a supervisor may also include owners, managers, superintendents, charge hands, lead hands, foremen, uh, departmental heads, journeymen, and trainers. Um, it's clicking on its own. So there are many different hats that you can wear that falls under the supervisor. Um, but now we're going to look at what the supervisor is. So some of the requirements for the duties of the supervisor is to ensure the health and safety of the workers under the direct supervision of the supervisors. The supervisor must also be knowledgeable about the parts and the regulations about the work being supervised. So one of the best ways to do that is to uh, have reference to the uh, WorkSafe BC regulations. So if we're talking about mobile equipment, the supervisor should know what the the regulations are on that mobile equipment or at a minimum have access to the regulations where they could easily go and reference that if need be. And the third one here is to comply with this part of the regulations and again any applicable orders that's from WorkSafe. A supervisor must ensure that the workers under his or her supervision are made aware of all known or reasonable foreseeable health hazards in the area where they work. One of the best ways to identify this is doing a hazard assessment and a standard operating procedure with a competency test, of course, as mentioned. Um, finally, they need to comply with this part of the regulations and any other applicable orders. The supervisor must also consult and cooperate with the Joint Health and Safety Committee or the Health and Safety Representative for the workplace. And again, it's cooperation with the board. 
officers of the board and any other persons carrying out their duties under this part of the act or regulations. When I want to just give a quick point here with the WorkSafe BC officers. This is where they differentiate between uh, a police officer. If the police were to come on your site, they're probably looking at criminal negligence if there was an incident. They need to rule that out first. But um, the police need a warrant to look at your documents. A WorkSafe BC officer does not need a warrant. They can show up anytime, any place, go for a walk anywhere on your facility and ask for documentations at any time. They have more power than uh, here in BC than an RCMP or municipal officer that would require a warrant. So um, I've had companies in the past that uh, refuse WorkSafe access to this and again, um, it didn't work favorably in, in their case there. Uh, other duties here now of the workers. We've, we've done the employer, we've done the supervisors, now we're moving to the workers. Every worker must take reasonable care to protect workers, health and safety, and health and safety of others who may be affected by um, workers' acts. This is one of the best ways to know if you have a good health and safety uh, safety culture is when individuals are no longer looking out just for themselves is when they look out for one another. Um, the second point here, to comply with this part of the regulations as any applicable orders. The reason why it's kind of worded funny is all of these are direct quotes as you can see section uh, 116 of the Workers' Compensation Act. These are directly quoted from the Workers' Compensation Act. Duties of workers also need to carry out his or her work in accordance with the established workforce procedures that is developed by the company themselves as required by this part of the regulations. So what that means is if your company has policies and procedures then it is the duty of the worker to follow these. Otherwise they can end up... You could go down the progressive discipline road if, if need be there depending on the severity of it. We also workers um, use or wear protective equipment. So if the employer and the employer needs to provide the general personal protective equipment, PPE, uh, workers need to wear it if it is supplied by the employer. Um, that said, if you have a boot allowance or don't have a boot allowance and it's mandatory to have your steel toe boots, then uh, they need to wear their boots. Um, devices such as clothing and anything else by the regulation. So if we're could be, um, here we're talking, could be eyewear, helmet, uh, busy vest, gloves, it could be a certain Kevlar sweater, jacket, whatever. And the last one here is to not engage in horseplay or similar conduct that may endanger a worker or any other person. This sounds kind of simple for adults, but it's not always the case. And when um, the advantage I have is um, working for the Manufacturing Safety Alliance is I have a little eye on multiple companies throughout the year and uh, as a whole internally here we do discuss some scenarios or unfortunately we also discuss some serious uh, incidents and there is a large percentage of those incidents where uh, a worker has been seriously hurt comes from what would be considered similar, uh, simple horseplay that uh, something happened uh, and it didn't work out favorably for the uh, individual. Moving on, we also need to ensure the workers here need to ensure that basically they show up for work in a state where they are able to work. So the work without risk to his or her health or the health and safety of another person um, this is being not impaired by alcohol, drugs, or other causes. That's kind of a, a general given one that's uh, the same across the board. Other duties. Workers need to report to their supervisors or employers any contravention of this part of the regulations or applicable orders which the worker is aware of. So if they see something not being done correctly or a potential hazard, a worker has the responsibility to report that to their supervisor. 
if they have a conflict, say a character conflict with the supervisor, one of the other means is for that employee to go to either their Joint Health and Safety Committee member or their safety representative. Um, that is always a, an avenue that is open to all employees. We also, the worker needs to report any kind of absence or defective uh, of any protective equipment, whether this is a device, removing of a guard, or having a, a piece of equipment that should have a guard that is no longer there, clothing, existing of any other hazard um, that a worker considers is likely to endanger that worker or any other co-worker working beside them. And that last page here, uh, workers also need to cooperate with the Joint Health and Safety Committee or the worker representative, the health and safety representative for the workplace. They also need to cooperate with the board, again that's WorkSafe BC, any officers of the board uh, when they're carrying out their duties under that part of the regulation. Now we're going to look at management overall. We looked at the employer, we looked at the supervisor, we looked at the uh, workers. And they are the three categories that WorkSafe uh, defines. So now we're looking at the management. And here there is a quote. A leader doesn't have to be a manager, but an effective manager must be a leader. And as we said there before, leading by example is, is the number one best way to do it. Um, but as managers, they must have a plan, a schedule. They need to have control over production quality, safety, and costs, and act as a role model, a leader in daily operations. Supervisors, again, now can either be part of the management team or a specific level between management and the workforce. Supervisors must have the skills developed to oversee day-to-day operations of specific areas of the workplace. One of the common hazards or trends in most companies is senior a senior employee gets promoted to the supervisor without any training just because they've been doing it the longest or they've got 10 years or 15 years in compared to whatever. Employers must ensure that those supervisors do get training and the supervisor themselves need to advocate that they need the training as well. So lastly, there's an OH&S advisor. So some people have this advantage. This webinar, you could say, is acting as your OH&S advisor. Some companies consult. Some have safety advisors come out on a rotational visit. Um, but Let's read it here. Any organization requires an identified person to coordinate and advise the management on the workplace health and safety issues. The way that I see a health and safety advisor, and when I'm on site with one of my clients, I'm the island that floats between management, the employer, and the employee, the workers. My job is to relate health and safety issues and to be honest about it. There's nothing worse than not being honest about it and um, being untruthful. So, uh, OHS advisor, they must have the knowledge and experience in education, um, provide accurate and timely advice to management. So, with that first one, having knowledge, experience, and education, although you are in the webinar series, we do have additional online learning that would could be beneficial to you if you're looking to. Um, raise your knowledge if you are going to be the advisor or you are the safety representative or maybe you're a chair or a member of the Joint Health and Safety Committee. So now we're getting close to the end here, lesson one. There are three multiple choice questions. We're going to do the first one first. This will be a poll question. You'll see the ability to answer this question. So the first question is, which is the employer not responsible for? And in the second here, the polling question will come up and you have an option of answering A, B, C, or D. Once you select it, you can hit submit. And then it will give us a graph of how we've answered.
Okay, so we've just cold, pulled. Yes, very good. Everyone got that one right. So we need to do, we need to address potential hazards, but we need to do it uh, immediately and it's not when time permits. The second question here is a true or false question. Managing safety as a supervisor means to change the unsafe behavior through We close the poll, we look, intervention, yeah. Okay, and the third question here is a multiple choice again. Which worker responsibility statement is incorrect? Okay, very good. We not only want to look out for ourselves, but <laughs> we also want to look out for um, others around us. Correct. So that is the summary of lesson one. We talked, we had an introduction to duties of the employer, the duties of the supervisor, the duties of the workers, the duties of management, and then an OHS advisor. Lesson two is the OC requirements. And remember, OC is the Occupational Safety Standard of Excellence. So here are the OC requirements. The program contains an OHS policy and assigned OHS responsibilities for all levels of the organization. We need effective two-way communication on OHS issues. Anything health and safety should be tr transparent, whether it's from the CEO slash president level down to the workers. Um, health and safety needs to be transparent. A good, effective occupational health and safety management system will have annual goals and objectives with an action plan. So when we look at the webinar series that we're doing, developing elements for each one of the um, webinars that we are going to do is an easy way to start your action plan because you're developing the element for your uh, occupational health and safety management system. An organization's occupational health and safety policy is a statement of commitment to an effective health and safety management system. Here this is a one-page policy is what we're looking for and um, there are now three examples on our webinar resource uh, page that you could easily look up and um, uh, reference that to develop your own. So some of the things that the policy must include is a signature of the organization's most senior management, and that needs to be reviewed and dated annually. This is the big one where um, it's often almost done correctly, but someone forgets to sign it annually. Um, it needs to have a statement referencing the organizations to uh, OHS commitment, reference to legal compliance, uh, assign OHS responsibilities for uh, employers, managers, supervisor, workers, and others. Um, this is just a brief two maybe three sentence paragraph for each one of those. We're not getting into the fine details. Um, uh, that comes later, but for the occupational health and safety policy, it's a one pager. So just a quick one, two sentences about what managers are, uh, what supervisors responsibilities are and what workers are. Uh, one of the uh, examples that you will see will also include the responsibilities of the Joint Health and Safety Committee and contractors when they're on site. It needs to have a commitment to provisions of adequate OHS resources, and you need to have a way to communicate uh, policies to all levels within the organization. 
Effective two-way communication is necessary for any successful OHS program. Senior management communicates their their commitment to health and safety to employees regularly. Um, with a small company, one of the best ways to do this is um, crew talks. Have those documented. Um, have them recorded. When we're doing crew talks, I would ensure that you write down key points and uh, give examples of what those key points are. I'll quickly tell you a scenario where an individual was uh, severely hurt and um, ended up with uh, two broken vertebrae, a punctured lung, and is now um, a paraplegic. He's only he was only 23 at the time. When I was asked to go on site to help with the investigation. I asked the supervisor if he had done a crew talk that morning. The supervisor said yes. Then I asked him, was it documented? He said yes. I asked him to look on, look at it, and he didn't even have a sentence down of what he discussed. Now when I talked to him, he talked four or five points and he talked for 20 minutes. None of that was documented, so he couldn't prove that that uh, crew talk uh, happened. So it put them in a very awkward position. Again, if it's not documented, it never happened. And when we talk about crew talks, one of the things we need to talk about is feedback. We need to have a section where employees, whether give them the opportunity to ask a question. And if they do ask a question, write it down what it was, and then write down what the answer was. Because if we're um, still a small employer, we may look at, uh, posting these minutes on, or these uh, crew talks on our health and safety board and people um, that were not in attendance or or maybe didn't hear the answer could have reference to that at a later date. There's also the process for uh, supervisors to communicate health and safety information to workers regularly. This um, I would also include positive and negative uh, uh, behaviors. There's no harm in um, rewarding people for doing the right thing. Give them a pat on the back. But at the same point, the supervisor is responsible to take action and have a word with someone if they're not doing it correctly or not doing it safely. Sometimes this gets uh, a little blurred sometimes when the supervisor is overseeing a brother, a sister, a family member, or uh, a, uh, an outside of the work buddy. Uh, the OC requirements, the system to ensure communication of health and safety issues to employees. Um, one of the best ways to communicate any kind of health and safety, um, not even issues, just any kind of documentation is one, to have a manual and two, to have a health and safety board. And at a later date, we'll talk about what is required on that health and safety board. And as I mentioned uh, previously there, the process of feedback on health and safety issues for employees. Have an open forum where they can ask questions, whether it be at the crew talk or even an open door policy um, where they can approach either the, the health and safety representative, a member of the joint health and safety committee, or even higher up if need be. Everyone in an organization has certain health and safety responsibilities. It starts from the CEO right down to the newest worker on the floor. Everyone has roles and responsibilities at all the different levels. The OHS performance should be included as a company's key performance indicators. This one is often missed. Um, and what it's asking here is at the beginning of the year when we're projecting what our company, what we wanted to do, why don't we add in health and safety to that? Maybe it is develop an element, maybe, well, hopefully it's develop more than an element, but maybe a program. Or to reduce maybe an eye injury by 10%, a hand injury by 10%. We're going to talk about uh, uh, health and safety goals in a minute, but um, it should be included there. Make safety part of the overall performance. And then have site-specific rules and requirements. This could be anything from uh, a no smoking policy to a no uh, cell phone policy on the floor to wearing appropriate uh, protective equipment. Um, 
We also need to have something that enforces, that deals with the enforcement um, for OHNS issues. And unfortunately or fortunately, this is usually a progressive discipline. Um, normally, this is four stages where you get into a verbal, and then the next stage is a written warning, and the third stage is uh, suspension, and then the fourth one is termination. It's very important to make sure that we have a, a, a sentence in there or a statement saying that depending on the incident, it can go from one to four. Again, we need to have communication at all levels, and we need to evaluate the performance of managers, supervisors, and workers on OHS. So one of the things here is anything in health and safety, you'll see this common plan, do, check, act. So the first section is the plan, to establish um, objectives and processes. And this could simply be to identify your problems or challenges. So for instance, one of the plan, do, check, act, the planning here could be to build a uh, occupational health and safety management system. The next section is the do. This is the implement process. And the best way to describe this is to test potential solutions. So whatever you came up as your challenge, come up with what your identify your challenges, come up with some ways of some solutions of uh, addressing those challenges, and then run them through its course, see if they work. How do we tweak them? Do we need to tweak them a little more or a little less? The third is to check, and this is the monitor and measure process. And the, the best way to describe this is to study the results. Now we're going to look at, we had a challenge, we're doing something about it, how successfully are we meeting our challenge? Are we uh, meeting it? Are we exceeding it? How, how can we make it better? And the last one is to act. It's to take action and improve process performance. And basically this is implement the best solutions. You know, there's nothing wrong with trial and error. And here's the thing that WorkSafe wants to see no matter what site they walk on. WorkSafe wants to see that you've identified an issue or a potential hazard and you're doing something about it. It doesn't have to be the best textbook answer, but it may be the best answer that you have with, you, with your knowledge at the time or your budget, right? WorkSafe wants to see that one, you've identified it and two, you're doing something about it. And then you're checking to see how well it's actually working for you. So we talked about safety culture at the beginning, and here we're going to talk about it a little more. Safety culture promotes and reinforces an OHS management system. Every company has a health and safety culture, whether it's a positive or a negative. Every company has one. So what we want to do is have the organization or your company develop a safety culture commitment statement that includes safety goal. Um, I will be adding a safety culture survey to element A shortly. Um, it's one that we like to roll out to our clients. It's uh, 24 questions. And the way we do this is we roll this out. We let them uh, fill it out. It gets reviewed by the Joint Health and Safety Committee or the Health and Safety Representative and Management. We look at what some of the low scoring areas are and then we try and improve that and we make that a health and safety goal for that quarter or that uh, that year. Um, one of the best ways to do this is to do the same test repeatedly, I would say every six months to a year, and until you have really good results all the time, you're going to keep doing the same survey. Then we have an additional survey that uh, comes after that one when, when you're scoring at a high level and you need a harder or more thorough uh, safety culture survey. So the safety culture, um, it is a process that exists to a baseline and a benchmark for developing a healthy and uh, safety culture survey. So the first time you do this, this is considered your baseline or your benchmark. As I said just uh, a second ago, you do a second one six months or a year later and you try and show that um, there's improvement and if there isn't the improvement then we need to look at what areas didn't improve did we improve in the areas that we wanted to and how are we going to improve those areas the safety culture survey also acts as a tracking system and it 
uh, reinforces positive behavior. Um, here I have a, a review question here. This is a true or false. An organization's health and safety, yeah, I'll let you guys read it there. It'll come up. We'll open up the poll. So, correct, 100%, everybody's good there. The next question is a multiple choice here. So this question should read, um, how often should a health and safety goals be set? Weekly, monthly, by annually or annually? Um, oh, there it is down there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, just on my screen for the poll, it didn't show that the, the four answers were there. Yes, correct. Okay. Very good. So that was the summary of the OC requirements. Uh, we discussed uh, in lesson one the duties. We discussed the uh, OC requirements. Um, I just want to, before I open it up to everybody, uh, if they have any other further questions, I just want to review that um, by signing up with the webinar series, um, OHS Principles of Occupational Health and Safety Management System was uh, available for anybody to take uh, with this. Um, with 60% um, participation moving forward here. Um, in September, so between now and September, if your company uh, is 60% plus participating, um, you are eligible for free in uh, auditor training, uh, and that'll be in September. And if at the end of this um, webinar series, you still hold a 60% or more participation, um, you get a free small employer building course. Uh, it's, it's quite a valuable and it basically sums it all up. So uh, the, the principles of OHS management, the free auditor training and a small employer building course is a value of uh, over 500 bucks. So it, uh, it's quite a little incentive to, uh, to participate every three weeks. So I hope to see you all uh, repeatedly <laughs> and on schedule. So I'd like to, if you have any questions, um, you can text them in and uh, we'll take questions live off the floor. Okay, so, sorry, let's go to the next slide here. So it's just a question period here. So someone has asked, um, can I review the definition of due diligence? I can. And I'm going to read this one from a, a, a WorkSafe. Um, on our resources that we have, I've added two WorkSafe BC PDF files. And I, uh, I find them very valuable. and um, I think you guys should all have a copy of each one of them. It's an easy download of a PDF. One is called Managing Safety from the Supervisor's Perspective, uh, a cornerstone, understanding the four cornerstones of due diligence. And the other one is a Manufacturing Safety, um, an Occupational Health and Safety Guide for uh, Manufacturing. I think these are both very valuable PDFs, but I'll go back to the question of what due diligence is. Due diligence is defined as taking all the reasonable care to prevent the occurrence of an incident or an event. Due diligence 
in safety management can be described as a systems approach that provides information, instruction, training, supervision, verification of knowledge, and correction of physical and human hazards. I also like to say due diligence is your second layer of um, insurance. You're doing what any other man, uh, reasonable company would do. Um, there is a um, checklist for due diligence, and we're going to add that to the, uh, the resource page. And it has been used in court um, where a company was able to prove using this checklist that they did what any other reasonable company would do. And with Bill C-54 now where managers, owners, presidents, owners, supervisors, co-workers can all now be criminally charged, um, your defense against criminal negligence is due diligence. Um, and there's a quick page that uh, summarizes that. The basic elements of due diligence is information and in, uh, instruction, that's education. This is the part of the system that it ensures that workers receive the appropriate level of education that they need to work safely. Education routinely takes place in a classroom type settings, crew talks, one-on-one -on -one safety reviews, or through written or verbal directions. The next basic element of due diligence is training. And we've talked about this, but I'll read out what it says here. Training typically takes place on the job assigned. A training system includes training standards, selection of trainers, uh, supervision during training, verification of training, and demonstrating competencies when training is completed. The basic elements of due diligence for a supervisor. They need to, a supervisor needs to verify um, training and education, identify and correct hazards, direct observations of workers, uh, correct unsafe or unwanted behaviors, direct and instruct workers, respond to workers' questions and concerns, and again, as stated, document. So if there are no further questions, um, thank you very much for coming today or signing up, and uh, I hope you got something out of this. You have my email if you need to uh, reach out to me or have any additional questions. Uh, one, other question, one other question was asked, and it was around the uh, usability of the webinar itself. Uh, the question was asked, uh, is this webinar available at any other time? I just wanted to let everybody know, in case it wasn't clear from the beginning, that the webinars are recorded, and they will be posted on the Learning Center along with all of the resources that Charles has been speaking about. If anyone is unclear about how to log into the Learning Center or unclear about any of the resources, Please do ensure that you email us and we'll make sure to get you the information that you need. Okay, that was an excellent question and that was a good one saved for the end of the group that everyone could benefit from. So yeah, it is recorded and, and you have access if you can't make this time. Um, okay, so that's element A, management, leadership and commitment. Thank you for uh, signing up today and we'll see you in three weeks for the next one. Okay, take care.